So over the past three days, we've been, been inspired by change makers and learned from one another about how to ignite progress in our communities, our nation, and our world. At the Lore Foundation, our mission is to support prosperity while preserving the character of rural towns in the Mountain West. Our grant making helps to accelerate new ideas, elevate the rural voice, and measure impact. We believe that residents and community leaders can develop homegrown solutions to address their unique challenges. And we've learned that when local governments, nonprofits, and the media create opportunities for participation and spaces for engagement, and unleashes a wealth of creativity. Like all of you, we are constantly exploring how to make promising solutions spread farther and faster. That's why I'm so excited to have Jeremy Hyman's and Henry Timms with us today to share their lessons for building movements of change. Jeremy is a lifelong activist and the co-founder and CEO of Purpose, an organization that builds and supports social movements around the world. Henry is president and CEO of the 92nd Street Y, a visiting fellow at Stanford University's Center for Philanthropy and Civil Society and co-founder of Giving Tuesday. Together, they are authors of New Power, How Power Works in Our Hyperconnected World and How to Make It Work for You. The book investigates how ideas catch fire and activist communities come together. It answers critical questions facing all of us as communicators. How do we create ideas that are championed by our audiences? How do we turn policy into a movement? From patient-centered medical communities to Black Lives Matter, New Power explores how increased transparency, cooperation, and choice are reshaping our world. Please join me in welcoming Jeremy Hymans and Henry Timms. Well, hello, it's fantastic to be here. Uh, what a beautiful venue. I'm Jeremy. Uh, and I'm Henry. The Australian and the Brit. So there'll be, there'll be some tension that will unfold over the course of the... Which we will the resolve. Well, well, we'll see. Over the passage of time. <laughs> so uh, we're going to talk today about power and how power is changing um, and what it means for the organizations that, that you work in and run and what it means for all of us at a pretty critical inflection point. And to start, we're going to start with a bit of a downer, which is that we're going to start with Harvey Weinstein. So we think for a moment about how Harvey Weinstein exercised his power. His power was like a currency. He had it, you didn't, he spent it down. He could start and stop movies. He could start and stop careers. He could start and stop rumors. For decades, he literally held an industry in his hands. There was a survey done of the people who have been thanked the most times from the stage of the Oscars. And in first place, jointly, was Harvey Weinstein and God. So think, though, we're going to lift your spirits now. Think, though, <laughs> about the Me Too movement, right? So if you think of Harvey's power as power as currency, the Me Too movement can be better thought of as power as current. So it's something that gets stronger and stronger the more voices are added to it. In fact, the enabling element of Me Too is that one person's testimony makes it easier for the next person to stand up and speak up. And it surges like a current in that it moves around the world from industry to industry, and as it does, it changes shape, new leaders emerge. Um, it's a fundamentally different form of energy, and it's one that's produced very rapid social, cultural, and political change. So next story, Barack Obama. So we all remember the, the enthusiasm. We are the change we are waiting for, the, the micro donations around the country, people grabbing this campaign and making it their own, this extraordinary movement that Barack Obama uh, built up to uh, push aside uh, Hillary Clinton and to unexpectedly end up in the White House. But perhaps one of the uh, critiques of the Obama presidency would be although a movement got him into office, he then left that movement behind. So you can think that that movement he built did not move without him. The participatory energy of his campaign was missing, so that after eight years, uh, he was handing the keys to the White House to not his successor, but Donald Trump. And the party he led was not as strong in many ways as it was when he started, despite the fact that Barack Obama was enormously per personally popular at the end of those eight years among the people who had elected him. 
The next story is about a Scottish schoolgirl called Aksa Mahmood. So she's 17 years old. She lives in Glasgow. She loves Harry Potter. She's described as somebody who can't find her way to the center of Glasgow on the bus on her own. But in the evenings, uh, she's been radicalized online. She becomes a bedroom radical. And one day, she simply disappears. Uh, three days pass, and her parents are frantic, and the phone rings, and her mother picks it up, and it's Axa calling her, and she's on the border heading into Syria. And she's telling her uh, that she's joined the Islamic State, and she's never coming home. But her story doesn't end there. So she gets to Syria, she becomes one of the most effective recruiters for ISIS, and we studied her methods. And she was very good at building this kind of very dark girl-to-girl -girl network that groomed other girls from the West and perfectly adapted this ideology um, to how you would get another girl from the West over to join you in Syria. It was a, there was a Tumblr with these memes and emojis that made it approachable, almost friendly. Uh, here's how to say goodbye to your family. Here's what to pack when you're coming to make jihad. And in doing so, uh, she was very effective at allowing this ideology to spread sideways. We contrast that to the US government when they first faced the threat of ISIS in the propaganda wars. So the first thing that the US government does when they're trying to out-message Aqsa and people like her is they fly airplanes over Iraq and Syria, and out of the back of those airplanes, they drop paper cartoons, and the cartoons show you how bad life will be if you become a jihadi, and those float down onto the heads of the civilian population, and that tactic, 100 years old, doesn't work. So they embrace social media, and they set up this Twitter account, um, to dissuade potential jihadis, says, think again, turn away, helpfully in English, with the biggest, <laughs> with the biggest possible State Department logo you can find. And which, we all know potential jihadis are just huge fans of US foreign policy. Um, this does not work super well. So three stories we've told you. We've told you a story about the Me Too movement and the way it swept away people like Harvey Weinstein, we've told you the story of a president who extraordinary surge of mobilization to get into office, but then he leaves that crowd behind. And we've told you a story of a 17-year-old schoolgirl, essentially with no resources, who out-messages the limitless resources of the US government. And these three stories point towards the underpinnings of the work Jeremy and I have been doing, which is to say this, that the way we understand the future isn't through understanding how technology is changing, but rather how power is changing. So you think about what Bertrand Russell said when he defined power. Power is the ability to produce intended effects. And we argue that old power and new power are just two very different ways to achieve those effects. So Harvey's methods, right, power as currency, this ability to uh, exploit the fact that there's something that you know, that you own, that you control, that nobody else does. So you're reliant on these dynamics of download and capture. Um, you're reliant on a system that is closed. But the new power world relies on very different dynamics. So think of the new power world as these dynamics when power is made by many. It uploads, it doesn't download. It shares, it doesn't command. It's the power of the current. It flows and it surges. You can never quite own it. But if you can shape it in the right direction, you can get to the outcomes you're looking to find in the world. So here's another way to think about the difference between uh, old and new power. What's this? Perfect age group. Perfect age group for that. <laughs> so Tetris, the number one video game of the 20th century, right? The most popular video game in the 20th century. Um, most popular game of all time. What was that? The it remains well, the right. most popular game of all time. Um, and uh, you, think about, uh, you think about the dynamics of Tetris, right? So it's a perfect metaphor for old power. These blocks are falling on your head. Your job is to sort them out into neat rows. The blocks get faster and faster and faster until they eventually overwhelm you, right? So you are a cog in a wheel. You have very little agency in that system. Um, and ultimately, what you learn is that you can't beat that system. But contrast that to the number one game of the 21st century. This game is Minecraft. So Minecraft, if you don't know it, is the uh, block-based, like Tetris, is blo a block-based game. But the dynamics are very different. Uh, there are no rules to Minecraft. Nobody else sets the stage of how you play. It is literally a game built from the bottom up. It is collaborative. It is co-creators. Players from all around the world come together, and they decide 
what they want to build, and they build it on their own terms. So if you enter the world of Minecraft, you'll find houses, you'll find churches, you'll find synagogues, you'll find working computers, you'll find fantasy worlds. This incredible, extraordinary, emergent world is being unveiled by people who think not in the old power way, which is we wait for the blocks to drop on our heads and we put them into lines. Instead, a generation of people are coming into the world expecting to co-create. So that sort of brings us to this clash of values that we see playing out all around us. You think about being a kid, right, who's growing up in that Minecraft world and how different that is in terms of what you're learning about your role in the world, your expectations around participation, your relationship to rules and institutions. And you start to see how this clash is playing out. So we see this all around us, right, on institutions all the data shows this growing distrust of those institutions. And part of that is because these new power values are preferencing these more informal, more networked forms of governance. People don't have the patience for some of these formal structures. They're used to a world where they're getting instant gratification from the platforms in their lives, where the institutions are unresponsive at best, right, um, and hostile at worst. We also see this tension around transparency. So a lot of you work for organizations and you'll have constituents who come into your world expecting to know everything there is to know about the work you're doing, how much everyone gets paid, what decisions are made, who makes them, how things work out. We're seeing this real tension between a world where people used to expect a level of confidentiality. If there's a need to know basis in the old power world that's being very threatened in an era of WikiLeaks and, Le and leaks in general, where this need and this desire for transparency is very much part of a new power mindset. And we see this playing out in all sorts of interesting and bizarre ways. There's a politician currently running in the, in the midterms, uh, an independent candidate for governor of Arizona. So this guy realizes that norms around transparency are changing. His name's Noah Dyer. So he says, I'm going to just preempt these dynamics. So he creates a section on his website called Scandal and Controversy. And in that, on that section, he preemptively discloses uh, his entire sexual history. He says, there are videos. Um, and he says, you know what? I wish everybody the same freedoms that I've enjoyed. So he sort of upends a dynamic that, that when we think about uh, these roles, we think about the, uh, this idea of how much we can protect. And instead, he's thinking how much uh, he can share. So it's an extreme example, but it shows you how much things are changing. We also see this tension around expertise and maker culture. So we remember during Brexit, the, the, the big line was, we've had enough of experts. And look at the polling data on experts and trusted experts, which is falling around the world, and think about your own work. Think about the experts in your world and how they communicate. And one of the things we think with this work is, one of the key arguments Jeremy and I make is not that old power values are all bad and new power values are all good. That is not our argument. In fact, expertise, it seems to us, matters more than ever. If you think now about the threat to the set of kind of enlightenment values that were our bedrock, a uh, belief in science, a belief in reason, a belief in empiricism. All those things which underpin so much of our architecture of our society are now under threat. And one of the great dangers of our time is experts are being left on the sidelines because they aren't able to communicate in a new power world. Some of the smartest people we know are still entering the battle for ideas armed with nothing more than a white paper and an annual symposium. Not Comnet, to be clear. Um, and then, <laughs> the, <laughs> well, and then, the other thing I want to say about expertise. Exactly. It was the annual that, that really. Uh, that, well, that, Comnet is 365 days well, a year. Exactly, generally. exactly. And then finally, and I think this is very relevant to many organizations in the social sector, you know, how affiliation is changing requires very significant rethinking of our, of our models in the social sector, right? Because people are not card carrying members of organizations, because people today tend to be more affiliative but less loyal and less enduring in those patterns of affiliation. So we see these dynamics playing out all around, and it kind of led us to this framework. We first uh, uh, sort of run these ideas past the world in Harvard Business Review in an article a few years ago, and everyone who's ever read Harvard Business Review knows you basically have a contractual obligation to do one of these two-by-two two <laughs> matrices. So, so this so, so, we did, so we did one. Um, so what we're tracking here it, on, the, on the vertical axis, we're looking at models. So do you have an old power model or a new power model? Is your model like Tetris, where you kind of drop things down and people consume them? Or is your model like Minecraft, where you create this space for participation and collaboration? And then along the vertical axis, sorry, the horizontal axis, we're tracking values. Do you have old power values like confidentiality and expertise and managerialism? 
Or are you moving towards new power values where you believe in more collaboration, more openness, more transparency? So we'll take a quick tour of the compass over here. I've discovered, by the way, the laser. This is the first time I've used it. I'm like a small child. Um, <laughs> The, 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 the castles quadrant, right? These are, these are many of the organizations that we recognize from the 20th century. Um, you know, the organizations that are still rooted in old, old power, but you also see interesting companies like Apple. And we, we draw attention to Apple for an important reason. Firstly, Apple is a technology company, but deployment of technology does not equal new power. And if you think about uh, Apple, its business model, its core model, is really this idea that there are these product designers in California who know what we need before we know we need it. Um, and you think about the relationship Apple asks us to have with it. Have you ever noticed those Apple stores? The, um, the apple is where the crucifix is. Uh, and it glows, right? The orb, the glowing orb, right? It asks us to worship Apple. But it does not ask us to engage or participate um, the way some other brands we'll talk about do. And it's a secretive company. It doesn't do collaboration particularly well. That brings us to the cheerleaders. So the cheerleaders are organizations who still have an old power model, but are beginning to adopt new power values. So let's think for a moment about uh, The Guardian newspaper, right? For, for it was uh, launched to help repeal the corn laws in England. It's a very old power model, but they're beginning to adopt new power values. So if you're reading an article in The Guardian, halfway through you'll be prompted to take action on whatever the issue happens to be. The Guardian now has one of the biggest databases of police killings in the US put together by its own readers. And, and now they're actually making more money out of their readers becoming members and advocates and supporters than they're making out of their traditional advertisers. So they're beginning to give their reader a role which is a much bigger role than simply reader. So moving out of the crowds quadrant, new power models, new power values. And so uh, one type of crowd model that we see in that top right are these new decentralized social movements that don't even look like institutions, right? There isn't a door you can knock on in the case of Black Lives Matter or Me Too that really represents the movement as a whole. And I think one of the imperatives for organizations um, like yours is how do you actually develop an effective relationship with those movements? How do you harness that extraordinary energy? And how do you learn to play relay with those movements so that that energy can be turned into policy and power with some of the skills that this group represents. We don't see enough of that relay um, today. You also see models like Airbnb. These are models that are you know, quite skillfully building community uh, around uh, a new power model. So Airbnb just a couple days ago said, oh, we're filing with the SEC because we want to give equity in the company to our most engaged hosts. Now, this is a very smart business strategy for them. And part of what that reflects is that they, as a new power model, have decided to invest in trying to create a very symbiotic relationship with their base. But that's in contrast to the co-opters. So the top left is those organizations with old power values but new power models. So think for a moment about Facebook. One of the most effective new power models you can imagine, right, in terms of participation and engagement, there would literally be no Facebook were it not for the daily contribution of your data that you make to their model. But their values are actually very old power values. It's very closed up as a system. Um, their algorithm, which shapes our lives, our choices, our politics, is hidden from us. And for all of the openness and connectivity, uh, the value is actually extracted by a very small number of people. So that's the co op that's in the top left. So, we are not going to have a session on new power and simply talk at you for 45 minutes. So we are now going to ask you to meet your neighbor. And with your neighbor, for the next four minutes, answer this question, which is, where are you as an organization right now? Your organization right now, where are you on this? The, the, I hear the, some giggles. The, the um, uncomfortable laughs. The oh, and let's be laughter. transparent. Where are you now? And where should you be in five years? Where are you now? Where should you be? Um, so I think we have a talk.
Right. Okay. Old power time, old power. Uh, this is the great danger of letting the crowd take over. It's out of control. It's gone off the tracks. We're going to have to impose some old power. Mob rule, mob rule. Um, All right, so uh, let's, do a, let's, do a quick, let's do a quick survey. Uh, hands up for who currently thinks of themselves as a castle. It's going viral. <laughs> All right, so it's beginning to go across from Mikey. I'm going to predict that's about 30%, 30% some very enthusiastic castles in the morning, very, very proud castles. Uh, <laughs> me, I am. All right, so we've got some castles there. Who currently sees themselves as a cheerleader? Okay, uh, decent. Um, do we have any crowds in the house? Ooh. We have one solitary. And who is a co opter? Do we have any brave co opters? All right, great. Oh, yeah, good. You guys are clever. You're slightly evil, but clever. <laughs> Sh should we do the vote now on where you want to be in five years? So, who wants to be a castle in five years? Uh huh. I was expecting the co-opters to go, we, we want to move down to the castle. <laughs> um, who wants to be a cheerleader? Uh huh. Okay, yep, smart. Who wants to be a crowd? Great. And who is moving into that co-opter space? Uh huh. Excellent. So everybody wants to move, and we're going to tell you a story now about an organization who tried to make the kind of move we are all going to make in the next five years. This is a story about an organization who tried to embrace new power, but it didn't quite work out. And I love this story because it makes the English look ridiculous. <laughs> and this is a story, sorry, Henry, this is a story of a ship that a British research institution, NERC, had built. It's a big maritime shipping vessel. They were very proud of it. Uh, and it was going to sail the world to do environmental research. And they thought, why don't we engage the public? by asking them to name this ship. Henry, tell me what happened. Well, it didn't go super well. <laughs> so they issued their press release, their campaign, they were ready to go. They, they hoped that the public, the press release said on it, again, um, quick tip, there aren't many good social media campaigns that began with press releases. <laughs> but so the press release comes out, says hashtag name our ship, and it says perhaps you'd like to call the ship something like Endeavour or Shackleton, or Adventurer. And, and the great British public, the witty, extraordinary great British public, did not want to call this boat Shackleton or Adventurer. Instead, they came back with this. Boaty McBoatface. <laughs> this, this literally swept the world. Their website crashed. I, Hundreds of thousands of people voted for this. I, I might I, just add, wanna, I, I do want to say, yeah. just in defense of the fine people of Britain, I, they, 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 they do pretty well here. RRS, I like big boats, and I cannot lie. It, says, it seems very American. That was the, Amer that was the, the Americans invaded the voting. But uh, so look, you know, this was a debacle, but it was also a, ma a massive moment, right? This was the, the peak of public interest in maritime science, right, ever. And uh, the problem was that the, so basically they were all over the international press. Um, uh, there was a lot of excitement, there was a lot of joy. It felt very, very English. And yet uh, the science minister was not happy. So as the debacle unfolded, the guy who came up with the idea said this. <laughs> but, but then the great British public emerges again against him and surges and said, stop apologizing, and he retracts his apology the next day. <laughs> they, 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 they literally hold a parliamentary inquiry into this, which is what the British do when things go wrong. And uh, they called in an expert to testify, who was an expert in crowd, uh, crowd, crowd campaigns. And uh, at the end of the testimony, the, the parliamentarian uh, sort of says, thank you for your testimony, sir. Just out of curiosity, who did you vote for? And he says, Bodie McBoatface. <laughs> so, so the question is, what does an organization like this do in a situation like this? So here's our second poll of the day. Uh, you have these two forces coming at you. On one hand, you have the new power 
of the great witty British public who won voting with Boatface. On the other hand, you have your boss, your minister, your funder, who is saying you simply cannot spend $300 million on voting with Boatface. <laughs> Put this back in its box. So here is your question. Let's do a show of hands. Who is going to keep the name Boating with Boatface? All yeah, right. Absolutely. <laughs> well, you guys all lost your jobs. <laughs> and who is going to find something new? Who is going to abandon Boaty? All right, we have some. All right, this is very good. So you're, you're fully employed uh, for the future. <laughs> so they get caught between old power and new power. And of course, this is a funny story, but it makes a serious point that actually one of the, the, the dangers of this organization, they face the danger we see again and again with institutions, which is they see new power as some kind of stunt they can do once in a while, and they actually don't take it seriously enough. So we see four things that we can all think about. If you're thinking about how you can use new power in your own work, there are four things we think that stand out. So this is a framework we lay out in the book that helps organizations think about when and whether to turn to new power. These are questions that perhaps Merck should have asked before they launched this campaign, right? So the first question is about strategy. Do you actually need the crowd here to get a better outcome? And do you have something of value to bring to the crowd? Or are you doing this as a stunt, right, as window dressing? The second question is about legitimacy. You know, do you have any legitimacy with the people who you're trying to engage with? Or are you entering a space that really isn't yours? There was a, a famous story uh, shortly after the financial crisis. JP Morgan decided that they were going to do a social media experiment and launched a campaign called hashtag ask GP, JPM. And their hope was people would ask them questions with, like, you know, would you please um, explain what a derivative swap is? Um, of course, they asked questions like, how do you sleep at night? And how... <laughs> how how, how do you feel about having brought down the global system? <laughs> the third question is about control, right? Now, there's a the fallacy in this work is thinking that in order to use new power, you have to give up all control. That's really not true. It's actually about whether you're, you're willing to cede control around parameters you set and design carefully, right? The parameters were not set appropriately for the Bodhi campaign, right? And it, you know, with that, you then do need to be willing to accept a range of outcomes. If you're looking for a very specific outcome, don't ask people, right? But accept outcomes that are unexpected or suboptimal within parameters you've set, and you start to really get the benefits of unleashing people's agency. And finally, there's commitment, right? Are you in this for the long term? If this is episodic, if this is a stunt, then people's agency that you've um, uh, engaged, people are going to be left more disappointed and disengaged after uh, than if you've done nothing at all. So, so where does that leave us? So as we think about um, our world and our sector, if you're looking for the kind of the one key message and perhaps the call to action of our book is the future is a battle for mobilization. Uh, think now about this era of mass participation. We look across the world and you see the climate deniers are often out mobilizing the climate scientists. Uh, just this morning, there was new data which shows fewer parents are vaccinating their children. The anti-vaxxers are out messaging <laughs> the health officials. Those voices on the side of reason are being drowned out by people who can mobilize more effectively and more intensely than the people on the side of the angels. So as funders uh, and even as large uh, nonprofits, the question is, are you actually investing in new power, right? There's a, there's a temptation in our current culture to focus on technocratic solutions, things that are easily measurable, that have the veneer of precision. But actually, some of the most important work you can do is work that's actually investing in giving other people the ability to effectively advocate. So we think there's a huge underinvestment in new power, in movements, uh, in advocacy in this sector, vis-a-vis -vis those technocratic solutions. And really what that means is that if you're a funder, you hear a lot about this idea that uh, people these days are spending down their endowments. But, but what about the experiment of spending down your own power, right? Of doing work that makes you less powerful at the end of that work because you've actually conferred more agency um, on people uh, that you're serving. That's a very different power dynamic, and it's one that I don't think we see enough of. And then finally, one of the things that we're beginning to see more and more now as an implication is the most effective actors are those people who can bring together both old power and new power. And one question for your own organization is, are you able to deploy both old power and new power? So I think for a moment about the NRA. 
The NRA has this terrific old power strategy. They have this feared brand. Politicians will change their votes in advance of that brand turning on them. The, the, the NRA actually gives politicians grades, and politicians live in fear of being downgraded by the NRA. It's extraordinary old power. But what people often don't see is next to that old power brand, they have this new power ecosystem of local gun groups, of local activists, of community groups, which often don't have the NRA's logo, but they carry the NRA's mission. And so what happens is when these moments come, we still are in a world where 90% of people believe uh, in, in sensible gun control in this country. But when these moments of inflection come, those people are often outvoted by the intensity of the NRA's machine because their new power and their old power combine. So as we look to the future of the gun battle, one of the answers we want to point towards is how the other side of this battle gets good at old power and new power. So that really brings us to this question of how do you actually put new power to work? And we want to run you through a few steps that are particularly relevant to movement building. And the first of those steps is about this fight um, on, on guns. So uh, we were involved at Purpose, the company that I run, it, with starting this organization called Everytown. And Everytown is an attempt to build a counterweight to the NRA, and that requires a blend of both old and new power. And when we were starting that organization, uh, it was mums who were the nucleus of that. We called them the connected connectors of that movement. They were connected to each other, they were deeply networked with each other, and they were connected to the world. They were really powerful spokespeople. And there was nothing like the moral authority of these mums who'd organized after the Newtown massacre, who'd said, you know, we just have had enough of feeling that our kids are unsafe when they go to school, and they were protesting outside of Target against open carry, and those women became the powerful nucleus um, of the beginnings of a counter movement. Secondly, you need to build a new power brand. And that same organization, when we started that work with Michael Bloomberg's group, uh, his group was called Mayors Against Illegal Guns. And while that's a really important um, organization, um, that wasn't very open to participation, right? So we had to construct a brand um, that anyone could join, and we had to construct something that felt like it was part of um, every community, which is why we called the organization every town. We see this same principle applying in a bunch of other contexts. So you think about the Airbnb, when Airbnb rebranded, they intentionally created something that could be shifted and changed. They created a brand and the goal of which they even put together tools where people could adapt Airbnb's brand to tell their own story. And we also followed this um, strategy with Giving Tuesday. So I'll give you the quick plug now on Giving Tuesday, November the 27th this year has become the world's first global day of giving, and the brand guidelines for Giving Tuesday don't exist. What, what we said was people can grab this and make it their own in whatever they, they want to. So Giving Tuesday has become Giving Shoes Day, where Dress for Success work with women to take uh, off of shoes and clothes going back into the workplace. It's become Giving Blue Day, where the University of Michigan raised over $5 million last year. And so the brand itself is able to shift and it morphs around the world. And so you can see now, Every country involved around the world with no brand guidelines has taken this and made a brand in, in their own sense and in their own character. And that's what a new proud brand does. It leaves space for other people to brand you, not for you to brand your constituents. And I think what's so smart about Giving Tuesday was the intentional decision to make it ownerless, right? It came out of Henry's group, the 92nd Street Y, a big cultural institution in New York, but they really intentionally said, we're not slapping our brand on this, we're giving it to the world, and that decision is absolutely critical to the reach that that has had. The third step is about making it as easy as possible to get involved. This is the story of an Indian anti-corruption activist who figured out that the most easy way to get people in the door was to ask them to leave a missed call, which is a widespread practice in India where people basically call each other and hang up in order to save the phone charge. But to say, I'm running late, or I miss you, it's a very funny cultural context where the way you say to your lover that you miss them is by hanging up on them. <laughs> Uh, and he got 35 million of those missed calls. And he then took that frictionless beginning and did this, which has moved people up the participation scale. So one of the things people often think is these low-level actions don't add up to much, right? They're slacktivism, they don't really care, they're not really invested. But they're often something else. They're entry points into much more participation. So think about something like TED as a model. TED used to be just a conference where people would come and pay money and they would just 
have no role apart from to sit and watch. What TED did so well is they gave people more roles to play in their movement. So if you believe in TED, you of course can go to their conference, but you can also create your own conference. You can translate your favorite video. You can share it with your friends. They've created this architecture of engagement around their brand that pushes people up that path so they are co-owners of the TED brand. And finally, you know, movements are all about moments. And there's a skill around deploying those moments in order to mobilize people and to build something that's sustainable. And in the book, we identify three kinds of moments. We call them the three storms. And the first of those is storm creating. So think about Nike's decision to launch the Copernic commercial the day before the first day of the season. Um, this was long planned, this was behind closed doors. They were very intentionally deciding to drive this intensity around this moment. And their brand has benefited to the tunes of billions of dollars since that moment has come, because they were able to decide to create a storm. The second thing, though, isn't just are you able to create storms when you choose, but what you do when they come along. So this was a campaign that uh, we ran in New Delhi. There, there was a moment in Delhi a couple of years ago where the pollution levels got so bad that people literally couldn't leave their homes uh, or go to school. And so very quickly, this Purpose Climate Lab put together this campaign called Help Delhi Breathe. And it was a movement that took advantage in a very short period of time uh, an advantage of this extraordinary storm. And the kind of heart of that movement was training rickshaw drivers. So in Delhi, rickshaw drivers are the people who drive around the city, they're iconic in the city, training rickshaw drivers to talk about air pollution um, with the people uh, that they rode. And it really changed the conversation. And in a very short period of time, because of the intensity of that moment, the Delhi government within 72 hours announced the most ambitious solar policy uh, at any uh, level in India. And, and finally, find, storm embracing. So sometimes things come at you, and the question is what you do with them. So this is a group, a, a local chapter of the Girl Scouts in Greater Washington was offered $100,000 by a donor. And the donor said, here's your $100,000, just one thing. None of the money can go to transgender girls. And to their great credit, they not only sent the money back, but they launched a campaign called Hashtag For Every Girl, which reaffirmed what they stood for as an organization and the fact they were inclusive of all girls. And of course, they raised $350,000. Very awesome. So where does this leave us all, right? We're at this major historical inflection point where this new power is so strong, it's so powerful, but as we've described today, it's also being co-opted by some of the world's worst actors. And we think that the fundamental imperative is how can we all use new power to actually help the least powerful? And this is an example of a campaign that we ran for Syria. Building a movement around Syria is really difficult, right? Several years ago, um, there was very little Western public interest in Syria, despite the fact that hundreds of thousands of people had already been killed. Uh, and this was a time when aid levels were depressed because governments didn't have an incentive to, to really do that. There was no real refugee resettlement happening. So the work was to try to find a way to inspire people and mobilize people around something that they felt very distant from. And the way that we did that was we found a group of heroic civilians inside Syria who were pulling people out of the rubble after the barrel bombings. And we decided to figure out how to tell their story and then to build a movement around that story. And this is that story. في أحد الأيام تعرضت منطقة الأنصاري لقصف بالبراميل المتفجرة. حصلنا نطالع العائلة الأولى والعائلة الثانية. العائلة الثالثة هي الأم والولد. هي فعلاً يعني الأم كانت كثير منفعلة. عندها كثيرة كانت عصبية وكانت عم تصيح يعني هي خايفة على حالة أو خايفة على أبناء. بعد الحفل الطويل حصلنا نسمع صوت الولد صوت صار يبكي الولد. حصلنا نسمع صوته وكان كثير نحل صعب. بعد ما وصلنا لبد هون صار الشغل كثير بده حذر يعني هذا ولد عمره أسبوعين أو أكثر بأي لحظة بيطب شيفه أو بيموت أو بخلي الله أطلعها الساعة طبعا هي ما يمكن تنهار يعني عمل كثير حذر يعني هاي روح بدك تتعامل معها بشكل خطير جدا يعني إنه طفل عمره أسبوعين يطب فوق برميل أو تبتسق في ما يستيقوا شيء يعني وكل هالضغوطات 
وانه هذا الطفل يطلع اول البراميل واول مسؤوف اول من كل شيء So, you know, that's just one story, it's just a video. But, but off the back of that, we started to build a movement around these incredible uh, folks, the White Helmets. Um, millions of dollars was raised in crowdfunding, um, and tens of millions of dollars ultimately was raised to help these guys do their life-saving work. And it changed the way uh, Western governments thought about the Syrian crisis by finally landing it as a humanitarian crisis. This is that boy now. Here he is, he's in. He's safely resettled in Turkey, and I think you know, his story is, is a message and a lesson for all of us about you know, how we might start to use these very powerful tools um, to fight the fights that we face right now and all of you are facing that are so consequential. So on that happy note, Henry. <laughs> and so, uh, there are two things we want to tell you about before we finish. Um, the first, if you don't know about it, is the Lippmann Family Prize. And we wanted to share this with you because it's something we've been very inspired by. Uh, a friend of ours, Barry Lippmann, has put this together. It comes out of the University of Penn, and it's an annual $250,000 prize with actually prizes underneath that to support both innovation and leadership in the sector to take ideas often driven by new power and celebrate them and, and, and reward them in important ways. So if you don't know about this prize, it's exactly the right kind of prize for the people in this room. So do take a note of this web address, and I encourage you to enter. I've sat on the judging panel before, and it's an extraordinary thing. Uh, the second thing we want to bring to your attention is an experiment. So Jeremy will click one more slide. Here is our experiment today. Um, we haven't done this before, but it's going to be an experiment in collaboration and transparency. So here is the experiment in, in uh, collaboration and transparency. Um, we obviously, there is a book. There is a book tied to all of this new power. and We put all of these ideas and all of these lessons in the new power book. And obviously, we're hoping that people here today will buy the book. You can go onto Amazon right now. You can go to a bookstore today and buy it. But we're going to go a step further today, which is to say this, that if, uh, if you buy the book today, uh, or if you bought the book already, uh, or if you uh, have the book in any way, uh, we would love to send one to someone who you think would enjoy the book. So we will then pay for a book to go to somebody else. And the only thing you need to do is email one of us and just send us the address of the person you'd like the book to go to. You don't need to prove you've already bought the book. We're going to trust that that's true. And this is an experiment in seeing how the book can be shared in interesting ways. So they, they can't be a member of the alt-right, just to be really clear. <laughs> but they can definitely be British. <laughs> um, look. But this is about the mission of the book, right, which is how do we help um, folks who need to mobilize effectively around their values do it better. Um, so look, thank you. I, we, we want to finish by saying this. We, we count ourselves as fortunate to be a part of this community. You know, this week, in a small way, think about the inconveniences and the displacements that this conference has had and has obviously conquered in so many ways. But much more broadly, we as a sector, we as a group of colleagues and professionals, face so many uh, displacements, inconveniences, and in, at the end of the day, so many great challenges. The, 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 the work that we do, uh, it, we're both so passionate about it because we realize the stakes of this work, which is that it's people in, in rooms like this who need to master new power. So as we head back to our workplaces and, and to our missions, I encourage all of you to, to grab new power and let's push it in the direction of making a better world for all of us. Um, it's a pleasure to be here. Thank you. Thank you so much. <laughs>